The Meiji Restoration, as its name suggests, was an attempt to restore an emperor who had been a puppet for hundreds of years to more direct rule. That was a mixed enterprise that had mixed success. What it effectively uh, turned into was the emperor became the puppet of a new faction, ultimately a military faction that led Japan down a very destructive path in World War II. But the causes of that restoration were certainly both internal and external. Internally, as I've already suggested, there was a fair amount of contradictions that had emerged in this uh, status system that had attempted to freeze a status order as it existed in roughly the year 1600. By 1850, the world had moved on and there was quite a bit of restlessness in the ranks. A lot of people who were ambitious, including in fact lower ranked samurai who felt that they deserved to and had a better set of ideas for running the government than those who had simply stepped into power because they came out of illustrious families but didn't necessarily have the merit and the talent to be running the show. A lot of these lower level samurai were very restless and restless enough and nervous enough about Japan's survival in an imperially very competitive international order that they ultimately are the ones who pushed the Meiji Restoration forward. But that in itself, the, the very way that I've articulated that, suggests that behind them and motivating them was a dramatic change in the world order. In the 1800s, starting in the 1820s and accelerating into the decades of the 30s and 40s, whaling ships started to come in great numbers into the Pacific. And it happened that Japan sat very close to some of the richest whale, remaining whaling grounds in the 19th century. And so more and more foreign ships were coming into waters that the Japanese shogun in the 1600s had declared off limits to foreigners. Well, when you're hunting after whales, one of the things whaling ships did was put, if they, once they had harpooned a whale, they would send some of their best men into a little boat with the other end of the harpoon and try to chase the whale down. This is a recipe for shipwreck and those sailors often got washed up onto the shores of islands, including the Japanese archipelago, which stretches a thousand miles and more. And the countries from whom they had come wanted desperately to repatriate them. They were also eager to find sources of water and food out in the Pacific to keep these uh, vessels going for the very long duration of their expeditions. And they also eventually needed coal for coal powered steamships when those emerged in the 1850s and 60s. And this created a combination of economic pressures quite aside from the encroachment and competition among the European and North American powers uh, over empire, empire um, that brought more and more foreigners into Japanese waters and quite alarmed Japanese samurai and commoners alike about the future of their country. So it was in that climate that then those who felt that the ruling class was simply not serving the best interests of Japan took it upon themselves to depose the government and move very swiftly to erect a new unified government in its place. And one of the most interesting decisions that they made, and they had to do it within a year or two, was not to restore the capital in Kyoto, the traditional seat of the emperor, but instead to move the emperor from Kyoto to Edo and rename Edo the Eastern Capital. That's what Tokyo means. That was a major decision and the most compelling explanations I've seen of it suggest that it was done precisely to unify a country that had incipient tendencies to fracture along east-west lines. Eastern Japan was culturally somewhat distinct and there were some resentments uh, built up on both sides of the division line between East and West. And yet there were samurai who foresaw that a divided Japan would be potentially simply too weak to survive in the face of Western encroachment and who made a variety of sacrifices, including in the enormous expenditure of parading the emperor and the entire imperial court at, as you can imagine, it took a long time and it was not a cheap 
business to do this because it had to be done in style and they had to be put up in style all the way along the way and treated ceremoniously and then installed in Edo Castle. Um, so that actually was certainly a foundational moment for the creation of Tokyo as we know it today. Had the government been relocated to Kyoto, Edo probably would have lapsed into a major commercial city, but nothing like the powerhouse that it would become because modern Japan, building on the model of France and to some extent Korea, its neighbor as well, became a place with a very dominant primate city. The capital really has gradually amassed more and more of the population and resources and capital and educational facilities of the country. If you try to think of it in comparison to the United States, it's like rolling New York and Washington DC and Seattle and Chicago all into one. And as a result, that, that really did, that was a pivotal decision for the creation of modern Tokyo. The Meiji Restoration was relatively short and painless. I shouldn't say painless because there were a few thousand people who died, but on the scale of global revolutions, it's relatively, uh, relatively bloodless. And I think that's an interesting thing. The country did not experience major property damage. Even the city of Tokyo, was, Edo, was not burned and destroyed. And that was a, the fact that Japan was spared that kind of upheaval, I think, was also a big asset that it brought into its modernization phase. Uh, the Meiji period, which started with the reign of the Emperor Meiji being brought up to Tokyo, um, lasted from 1868 all the way up to 1912. So that's a very long period, one of the longest imperial reigns actually in Japanese history. And it encompassed so much change that a Tokyoite who had been born during the Edo period and had watched, had lived through the whole Meiji period, would probably look around him and say, I hardly recognize this city that I live in. So in concrete terms, concrete was introduced. <laughs> um, Bricks, the beginning of the building of brick structures, which dramatically changed the look and feel of downtown. The importation of Western styles of dress, at least for the elite, which created a sensation when these, especially women, paraded through the streets with their long flowing silk clothes with bustles and bright colors. Just women being outdoors. Uh, Education, state education being put in place, transformed the lives of children, created something called childhood, really, and adolescence set aside from, this long period set aside for education apart from adult working life as a national mandate for everybody. The elimination of the status system, this was one of the other things that happened very fast and made a big difference to the look and feel of everyday life on the streets in, in the capital city. You can be sure when the samurai were no longer samurai, they were ordered to cut off their top knots, which distinguished them from everybody else. They start wearing Western haircuts, Western dress. They take off their swords and put them in their houses, in, in, in their treasure chests. Uh, suddenly there is a, a physical manifestation all around you of an ideology of competition. Anybody can rise to success. Of course, inherited wealth still mattered a lot, but this ideology and the opportunities for rags to riches uh, life stories that it really did create helped to change and create a much more dynamic society, I think, where many people were willing to throw their energies into various kinds of capital uh, adventures, into higher education into building up the government, into civic organizations, opportunities that they hadn't had before and that channeled and mobilized in uh, vast reservoirs of energy that had been probably spent in pleasure pursuits and, or in much more um, small scale because restrained, constrained in various ways enterprises. So I think that also actually is part of the answer to how Japan modernized so rapidly is the unleashing of pent up energies from women as well as men and from commoners as well as elite. I think that the leveling of the playing field, imperfect as it may have been, really made a difference.